Great. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, and welcome to another webinar in the forum webinar series. I'm Renee Kuhlman, Senior Director of Outreach and Support in the Preservation Services and Outreach Department, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. In case you aren't familiar with the program, the Preservation Leadership Forum is the professional membership program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Our webinars are made possible by members of the Preservation Leadership Forum and we sincerely thank each and every member who is with us today. Today's webinar focuses on how state historic tax credits can help repurpose historic buildings um, to create new units of affordable housing. And before we begin, we would love to hear um, and type into the chat uh, your level of knowledge. Are you newbie? Are you somebody who's really experienced? Or are you somewhere in between? So we're very interested in hearing. So if you wouldn't mind sharing in the chat your level of expertise, we sure would appreciate it. Also, in terms of logistics, you are more than welcome to submit questions in the Q&A function um, directly to the panelists. We will answer them at the end of the webinar as time permits. Um, you're also encouraged to communicate with all of your uh, fellow participants through the chat function like you are doing now, if you have specific examples or thoughts you wanna share. And I'm pleased to note that the closed captioning function is enabled. Um, and we're gonna be sending out a recording of the webinar later today, uh, directly to the email that you use to register for this webinar. And all of our forum webinars are archived on our forum webinar library, should you wish to share them with others. Next slide. So nationally, we are seeing an uptick in the support for state historic tax credits. Um, in the past three years, four states have created new state tax credits, which is great. Uh, while other legislatures like West Virginia saw their credit made permanent or an increase in the overall cap of the program, uh, like in Arkansas. Next slide. Although all 39 credits, all 39 of the state historic tax credits encourage adaptive reuse and therefore help create new units of affordable housing. Today, we're gonna to discuss how states are laboratories um, and how three states, both urban and rural, have crafted their programs to address a lack of affordable housing. Next slide. In many ways, these incentives are modeled after the very successful federal historic tax credit and target properties listed or are eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. And with partners across the country, the National Trust is working uh, to also expand the understanding and guidance of the integrity provision to list properties on the National Register to ensure that incentives like state historic tax credits are widely available. I also wanna note that there are two bills pending before Congress that would help increase new creation of housing through adaptive reuse. Senate Bill 2266 was introduced last week by Senators Cantwell, Cardin, Collins, and Cassidy. Say that three times fast. Uh, while HR 2294 was introduced in April, uh, which mirrors what was passed in the last Congress's House Infrastructure Bill and currently has 56 co-sponsors. We're asking that you would ask your own delegations to co-sponsor these two bipartisan bills and also ask that they be included in upcoming infrastructure bills. And any questions about this particular advocacy campaign or the Federal Historic Tax Credit please reach out to my colleague, Shaw Sprague or Mike Phillips at the emails listed here. I know they're especially interested in hearing from folks who might have projects that have either been stalled or canceled uh, due to pandemic challenges. Next slide. It's now my great pleasure today to ask our guests who are with us now to share their own experiences in working with state tax credits. And I'd like to introduce the three of them to you now. John Egan currently serves as the Chief Lending and Program Officer at the Maine-based Genesis Community Loan Fund. And for today's presentation, he will use his 30 plus years of housing experience to describe how the state's investment is making repurposing buildings possible. Leslie Reed 
serves as the CEO of the Madison Park Development Corporation, one of the largest community-based nonprofit developers in Massachusetts. She also volunte volunteers her time to serve on the board of the Preservation, Boston Preservation Alliance. Today, Leslie will describe how Massachusetts sets aside 25% of its credits for affordable housing projects and the impacts the incentive has on the work of her own organization. And finally, we'll hear from Logan Ferguson, who is senior associate with Powers and Company. As a historic preservation consultant, she has helped clients apply for tax credits in many states, um, but will highlight for us today her experience with the Delaware credit, uh, which, which provides 10% more credit for depreciable product projects that qualify for low-income housing tax credits. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, thanks Renee. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Egan. Uh, I work at Genesis Fund here in Brunswick, Maine. Um, I sit <clears throat> historically on uh, Wabanaki land, the Dawnland Confederacy and Abenaki tribe as the historical occupants of this property. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the state historic uh, parallel that Maine uses uh, and specifically about um, how it can leverage uh, more affordable housing. We are a rural state and uh, so as such we get a very small allocation of uh, low income housing tax credit from the federal government which is as uh, many people in the room, not everybody <laughs> given the poll. Um, uh, knows that that's the number one tool that the federal government has for production of new affordable housing is the also sometimes called LIHTC. And I'll try and avoid using the acronyms because in, in looking at the responses from the poll, we have a, a wide variety of folks um, that are new to tax credits and, and people that have been here for, uh, for many years. So I'll try and, and navigate somewhere in the middle there with trying to keep it important and, and focused on what can really be effective, but not get too down in the weeds on the acronyms and such. So the, the state historic tax credit uh, in Maine is um, celebrating its 10th anniversary of official uh, existence. It was enacted initially in 2008 here, but not put into permanent state law until 2011. Um, and right on time, our state legislature is actually reviewing it with its um, program review committee through the legislature. Uh, and happily, um, that review is going very well because the uh, users and, and advocates for the program have collected a significant amount of data and stories to show how effective it really is. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, the, the way the, the tax credit works um, in, in Maine, uh, very similar to the way it's going to work in, in uh, many of the states that, uh, that have a state parallel program is that the, the credit is allocated if the project is also eligible under the National Register and can get an allocation of the federal historic credit. Uh, there's a long list of uh, secretary standards that the property has to meet. Um, you'll hear a little bit more from other panelists this afternoon on how those things um, uh, work and, and how you can uh, navigate <clears throat> those rules with getting the right professionals on your team, like Logan that you'll hear from later. Um, but the, the state credit in Maine um, works that the, virtually the statute that we have follows almost exactly word for word uh, what the federal guidelines are for getting a property eligible on the National Register. Um, one element that we do have in Maine is, is a small deal set aside because we are a rural state. There are many small buildings that would never really uh, be big enough to attract um, uh, federal cr credit investors and therefore the developer might not seek federal credits. And otherwise, uh, if the project is under $250,000 in eligible expenses, um, you can get the state credit without necessarily having to go through all of the criteria uh, for the National Register and the, and the federal credit. The state does have uh, a fair amount of ingredients that it's looking for in the project, namely uh, the history and use of the, of the property. Uh, but that's about the only sort of one-off in, in uh, eligibility for the project. Uh, Maine's credit, uh, along with eight other states, um, is refundable. And that's really important because um, the way a tax credit works in these projects, 
um, it, it becomes uh, an avenue to bring uh, equity, to bring cash to your project. But it can only do that if you can find someone to buy the tax credit. And in the state of Maine, um, the tax credit is delivered to the state taxpayer over a four year period. So you have to, as an investor, uh, you would have to wait four years to get your return of your full dollar back on your, on your tax credit, which means that it's um, attractive for uh, longstanding uh, private sector businesses in Maine that have significant state tax obligation to the Maine Revenue Services. Um, but the other important feature is that uh, as refundable, um, if you don't have a, a state of Maine tax obligation, whatever you're applying for that year can come back to you as a rebate. So a lot of real estate developers will look for that opportunity where they might qualify for a uh, million dollars in federal tax credits, and they'll qualify for a little bit more than a million dollars in state credits because our percentage is 25%, uh, so a million 250. But if you don't have a million 250 in, in tax obligation, what are you gonna do with a state credit? So the idea is that you then convert that credit to cash for your project. And that's what I'm gonna try and explain a little bit about uh, in the next few minutes. For, uh, for those who are, are familiar with how eligible basis, and that's one of those sort of inside baseball terms, it means how much of the expenditure, uh, not counting acquisition uh, of your project meets the criteria for eligible investment to drive credit. Uh, value. So if you're going to spend a dollar uh, on an eligible activity, 20% uh, of that or 20 cents of that dollar is going to be delivered back to you as a federal credit. And in Maine, it's 25% um, on, a, on a typical project. However, if you go um, to affordable housing, you can get that credit up to 34%. And these two credits are aggregated so you can put the federal credit and the state credit on top of each other. And if you are uh, uh, nifty on how you assemble your partners, you can get an investor to buy that 54% uh, credit. So that's 54 cents on every dollar that you're spending that's coming back to you as a credit. There's a little bit of a discount on when you sell the dollar of credit, you don't get a dollar in cash because there's some transaction and, and time involved in when they get that credit, but generally you're getting almost half of every dollar you're spending back to you as equity, not debt, but equity into the project to make it work. So if you're new to tax credits, that's the real powerful lever that a historic tax credit allocation um, can, can work. And I'll just answer very briefly that the property has to be a going concern, which means it has to be leased out as a commercial activity. It is not eligible for owner-occupied residences. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm working on my career as a architectural photographer. I might have a little bit more to go. Uh, our communications people always tell me to put more people in the pictures, um, but I'm always fascinated by the buildings. Here's a couple of uh, pictures in, in downtown Portland of some recent projects that my company has been involved in. Um, the one on the left is, is uh, a recovery house for uh, women in transition and their families. And the one on the right is for people with psychiatric disabilities who are otherwise at risk of being homeless or might have even uh, recently come out of an institution. Um, heavily supported housing from a local service provider. Both of these projects are using uh, federal credits. They're using state credits. And the way the state credit is working in each of these is that the developer doesn't have uh, a state uh, tax obligation. So they're gonna get the full rebate back from the state of Maine. And then uh, my company is making a bridge loan. So um, I don't, I'm hoping I don't lose anybody here, but we're loaning the whole dollar of, of the state capital, I'm sorry, the state credit into the project. And as the customer gets that rebate back from the state of Maine, they use that rebate to make a once a year debt service payment to my loan and it's paid off after four years uh, based on the rebate uh, schedule from the state of Maine because it's paid out 25% each year. So I'll go over that again in just a minute um, for people that are trying to follow along on how the finance works. But the, the tool here is that the uh, federal investor who's a local equity fund who's also 
um, purchasing the LIHTC credits. These happen to each have LIHTC credits as well. Um, is is buying the federal credits, and they're using their same investment pool that any other uh, equity fund investor would would use. And so we're able to leverage up a little bit more equity for each of these projects because uh, my company, Genesis Fund, is is making the bridge loan. Next slide. So the purpose of of really focusing on how to uh, push your state credit to further um, uh, provide equity into the project is to provide more cash, which means less debt. And if you have less debt in a project, then you have much more ability to provide affordable rents, which is why the main credit goes from 25% to 34% if you've got uh, rental units, at least half of the rental units are targeted to households at 60% area median income, which is a affordable housing vernacular. But essentially, if you're targeting rents for people that are between 100 and 150% of the poverty rate in terms of their income, they would be then eligible for uh, renting in that, in that project. So if you're, again, if you're taking, you have, let's say a million dollars worth of renovations, and uh, if you don't have affordable housing, that would generate 250,000 in state credits. If you do have affordable housing, it generates 340,000 in state credit. So you can see very quickly, that's an extra 140 grand in equity into the project. Um, add some zeros if you're in the bigger cities um, and, it, and it really makes it a, a big difference. Um, there's a couple of different ways that um, the state credit is converted into cash. The bridge loan model is one of them. There's another model where you can get a state nonprofit to be an investor, just like your federal credit is an investor and, uh, and, and use the same rebate back to that, to that nonprofit. Part of the reason why we have to be careful about who is your state investor in Maine is that that rebate from the Maine revenue services, right? You get your dollar of state credit, you send it into Maine revenue services each year for four years, they give you 25 cents back. But that dollar that you get as a rebate from the state of Maine, ultimately becomes a federally taxable event. So I'm not gonna go any further into tax consequences there, but uh, that's one of the reasons why we like to use a nonprofit. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, another acronym is that you can use uh, someone called a CDFI. If you've not heard of that acronym before, that's a community development financial institution. And um, that is a, a local nonprofit partner who usually has a mission aligned with your project to provide affordable housing and other more uh, envir uh, environmentally and, and community oriented solutions in the building, such as childcare or charter schools or whatever else might be going on. Um, so <clears throat> in Maine, again, the, the credit syndication or how you convert your tax credit into dollars um, is, uh, is can be in, in, in two ways. Um, that is, the developer takes the credit themselves and then they can uh, borrow a bridge loan uh, from my company, for example, or from others uh, and repay the bridge loan with that rebate as they get it back from the state of Maine Revenue Services or the, the tax collector. Um, or they can actually invite that nonprofit to join the project as an investor and allocate all of the credits to that investor who then does the same thing where they file for the rebate um, and, 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 uh, and, and get that's how they get paid back. So they make a loan, I'm sorry, they make an equity injection into the project and get and pay that back to themselves with the rebate. So there's a couple of different ways to, um, to convert the tax credit, uh, which ultimately is you know, a piece of paper on your tax return uh, into cash in the project. But the, the real effective tool here, uh, like in a number of other states, and I'm hoping to see more of them uh, take this on, is that you get a bump in the basis. So the, va the value of the credit goes up, in this case, almost 30% um, from 25 to 34. And that allows the project to attract a lot more attention and, and get more equity. And everybody knows if you have more equity in the deal, that means you can have less debt and then you can actually uh, afford to run the property on, on much more affordable rents. Um, so I, I'm, I'm I want to sort of like not go too much deeper than that, but I, I want to just indicate that um, we can go to the next slide that the 
Um, the purpose of this is to really focus on, on uh, assembling the right team. Um, if, you are, if you are one of the players in a community where you see opportunities with projects, you're gonna need a developer, you're gonna need a tax advisor, you're gonna need a historic consultant to help you go through the eligibility and, and application process. And you're gonna use your, your usual array of finance partners um, but again, look for a CDFI who is going to be a key player in your community, community development financial institution, um, that is going to be as motivated as you are to see that project come forward. Um, and you have to figure out how you can uh, how you can put that team together. Um, you know, not everybody's timeline is going to be on the same curve, and and not everybody's uh, cost structure is going to be on the same curve. So it's better to have those conversations early on. Um, and again, your, your municipal officials, as everybody knows, are, are key to this, because if you can't get your building permit or you can't get your zoning approval, you're not going very far. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stop there um, so we have time for everybody else's presentation. Um, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll be available for questions uh, after this. I'm going to turn it over now to Leslie Reed in Boston. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie Reed, and I have the pleasure to work for Madison Park Development Corporation. Um, we were actually founded 55 years ago um, before um, community development corporations were formally recognized in Massachusetts. And so we spent 55 years in the lower Roxbury neighborhood of Boston, creating and maintaining mixed income homes in addition to operating programs for families and children. Some of our key accomplishments is we've um, either produced or preserved over 1,500 homes um, where over 3,000 residents live. We do a lot of other great things in service of our mission to foster a vibrant, healthy Roxbury neighborhood. But I'm really pleased to talk to you today about how the Massachusetts State Rehabilitation Tax Credit has um, supported some of our work. Um, so the next slide. Um, in our portfolio of development, um, historic tax credit financing overall has helped us to either repurpose, um, restore, or rehabilitate 10 buildings that um, have 261 homes, um, another 30, 32,000 square feet of non-residential uses. Um, in at least three cases, we did adaptive reuses of buildings. So um, taking school buildings or industrial or other buildings and repurposing them for housing. And um, in all cases, um, our historic restorations um, of our buildings have enhanced both accessibility and energy efficiency. Um, and so historic rehabilitation has been really, really instrumental and um, ensuring that we can meet our mission of preserving mixed income homes in our community. And one thing that I wanna mention, there's a lot of people talking a lot about um, kind of the technical side and the financial benefits. Um, John did a great job of that, but I wanna talk a little bit about the community benefits as well. You know, Boston, Massachusetts is famous for our revolutionary history. Um, but our neighborhoods tell really, really important stories. And as a community-based developer, um, our, our work um, in using historic tax credits um, to repurpose and restore buildings also helps us to um, tell the stories of our communities and preserve what's valuable. Um, so for example, one thing that we've learned recently is that um, there's a lot of buildings, you see images here, uh, four story or more brick walk up buildings, which were homes to successive generations of workers in Boston, you know, Irish and Italian immigrants, Jewish families, and then subsequent um, generations of African American and Latinos. And um, they're, they're referred to um, in historic parlance as background buildings. Um, but these backgrounds, you know, tell the stories of our communities. And as developers, we are incentivized and have become quite adept at understanding the history of our buildings, telling the stories and leveraging the resources um, to preserve our history. So in that way, the historic tax credit has kind of, um, 
an additional benefit when it comes to affordable housing and community-based development. Um, and practical purposes, um, the benefit of the historic tax credit to a number of our projects is, as John indicated, we tend to do larger, more sophisticated projects. And we have combined um, our state historic tax credit with federal low-income housing tax credits. We also have a state low-income housing tax credit here in Massachusetts. We've used the federal historic tax credit and then added in the state credit. And in most cases, on average, we're able to leverage about 4% of the total development cost of the project using the um, state historic credit. That's averaged about $20,000 a unit. And the good news is that $20,000, almost 100% of it goes to enhancing the scope of work. Um, that we're putting into the construction and rehabilitation of these buildings. Um, so that is a great incentive. And then the teams that John mentioned that we have to assemble, the architects, the historic co consultants that help us navigate the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation have also increased our attention and capacity to um, the details of um, renovation of buildings. I've learned more about the profiles of muttons on window frames and the texture and color of mortar than I ever thought I would. But the attention to building technology um, has also increased the quality of the projects that we've delivered. And it's not in Massachusetts, but we are watching um, avidly um, when residential is developing a building, I believe in Connecticut, that is both passive house and a historic renovation. And so when it comes to um, the future of building technology, um, the historic tax credit helps us leverage additional capital that covers sometimes the, the, the incremental costs um, to enhance our scopes. Um, we also know in cities like Boston, when it comes to sustainability and resilience, we can't do better than using um, our existing buildings in um, thoughtful and creative ways. And so in that way, the state historic credit in Massachusetts has catalyzed um, a lot of successful work, not just in Boston and the Roxbury neighborhood that I work in, but across the state. And, um, for that reason, um, we think it's a really, really critical tool, especially when it comes to um, affordable housing development, which um, has now become you know, a national um, issue. And to the extent that this resource provides funding um, for equitable and thoughtful development that tells the stories and, and preserves the histories of our communities. It's a really um, fabulous and important opportunity. And we've been um, really proud um, to be deeply involved in that work in Massachusetts and the city of Boston. So um, I'm pleased now to turn it over to Logan Ferguson. Hi, uh, I'm Logan Ferguson. Um, and as Renee mentioned, I've been working with historic tax credits for over 15 years. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the technical side of federal and state credits, along with a more specific look into the Delaware credits and um, an affordable housing and tax credit case study that we recently completed there. Uh, the Federal Historic Incentive Program was instituted in 1976 to provide a 20% tax credit to facilitate the rehabilitation of historic buildings. In order to obtain the credit, the building needs to be a certified historic structure, meaning that it is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It also needs to be an income producing property and must be maintained by the ownership for five years prior to the completion of work. The proposed work must also meet the substantial rehabil rehabilitation test. Next slide. Uh, the substantial rehabilitation test means that a project must exceed, uh, project costs must exceed the adjusted basis of the building, which is calculated as shown in the table. Essentially, this means that the project must be of a fairly large scope would not, for example, be sufficient to simply paint the exterior of a building and receive a federal historic tax credit. Next slide. Uh, once you've determined that your project meets the required criteria, there's a three-part application process. 
Part one determines that a building is historic and documents its current condition through photographs and a written description. Part two describes the proposed scope of work to both the interior and exterior of the building through drawings and a written description. And part three documents that the work has been completed as proposed. All applications are first reviewed by the State Historic Preservation Office and then the Technical Preservation Services Division of the National Park Service, uh, this also known as the NPS. Uh, the NPS provi then provides final approval uh, with conditions or denial of certification. Next slide. Uh, the SHPO and NPS review the proposed scope of the project using the Secretary of Interior standards. So you can see on the slides a rather lengthy list, but it essentially requires that any work done to the building uh, maintain the historic integrity of the building. In general, any historic elements have to be retained or replaced in kind, and any new elements have to be compatible but contemporary. Next slide. A subcategory of the federal credit is a state historic tax credit, which is presently offered in 39 states. Unlike the federal program, each state has its own application process, project requirements, fees, and monetary allocations. However, uh, the process typically involves meeting the standard federal requirements along with supplemental information. Next slide. Of the 39 states mentioned above, only three have the supplemental credit for affordable housing. In Delaware, this is a set 10% credit, which was first offered in 2001 and is currently funded through 2024. In Delaware, the affordable housing and state credits are applied for jointly through a four-part process. The first three parts are similar to the federal credit, but also require the submission of preliminary certified costs. The fourth part is a reservation of credit, which involves a final accounting for the project. Next slide. Uh, this is a case study of a building that we recently completed in Wilmington um, using federal, state, and affordable housing tax credits. The building was completed in 1928 and stands as one of the few remaining intact examples of classical style architecture in Wilmington. It's also significant as the last standing luxury apartment building constructed in Wilmington before the depression and as the first high-rise apartment building in Delaware to be built with elevators. It was individually listed on the National Register in 1980. Uh, the building was placed in service in September 2020 and was completed at a cost of nearly 17 million, including QREs and non-QREs. It contains 51 affordable housing units. Uh, this resulted in a 30% credit of nearly 2.6 million from the state and a 20% credit of nearly 1.7 from the IRS. On the exterior of the building, the work including cleaning, repair, and repointing of all exterior masonry and metal. The most significant change was the replacement of all non-historic windows with new historically appropriate steel units. Uh, site work included new planting beds and sidewalks and the stabilization of two historic cast stone piers that flank the driveway. Next slide. On the interior of the building, the intact lobby and associated historic finishes were wholly retained. A small wheelchair lift was added to an adjacent sitting room. The historic circulation was also left intact, including the stairways, elevators, and hallways. Given the retention of the residential programmatic use, the interior configuration and historic fabric were also fully retained. In general, the kitchens and bathrooms are upgraded with contemporary finishes, and some of the units were made handicap accessible. Thank you for listening. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just flag for folks that the National Trust has entered into a partnership with another national organization called the National Preservation Partners Network. And we are working together to address four big issues that um, are challenging all of us and our states, including affordable housing and density. And um, so we have a, a working group that is uh, looking at trying to create more tools um, to help create new affordable housing and to retain older housing that is currently affordable. So um, the folks who are uh, managing that particular project are listed there if you wanna learn more information. But as those products become available, we will be sharing them on the uh, Preservation Leadership Forum. So be sure to look for that. Next slide. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the folks who are uh, working on that working group. And um, we are looking for examples of great um, tools that may be working to encourage affordable housing at this intersection with preservation and adaptive reuse. So 
uh, very much interested in hearing from you and stories and, and examples that you might be able to share. Next slide. So now it's the time for Q&A and I wanna thank all of our presenters for providing great um, information. And if you all could join me back um, by sharing your, sharing your, your screens and um, join me up here on the panel. Um, would love to ask you the questions that we've received so far in the Q&A. And also I have a few myself. Uh, so why don't we start with what the, the folks have asked. Um, Juliana Rose would like to know, does this apply for residential uh, properties? So I know that each state is different, but maybe you all could share whether or not residential properties are allowed in your state. Their state tax credit covers that. Uh, in, in Maine, um, like I think in most states, um, the state credit is not going to be eligible for homes or owner occupied properties. They do have to be income producing, which means there has to be a leasing tenant in the building uh, or tenants. Um, and that is a absolute requirement of the federal credit and uh, many state programs uh, parallel that, that element. So I would, I'd, I'd love to see if that, if a state had tried that, but uh, they would have to get over a pretty significant, um, hurdle with uh, matching the federal credit if they did. Uh, oh, so, oh, sorry. Some I states do. I know Virginia does um, for state credit, but it is definitely the exception. Um, absolutely. Yeah, so I know that uh, some states have a residential uh, program that's separate from their federal, um, the commercial state tax credit. Um, and so since each state's program is different, um, I would encourage you all to visit the State Historic Preservation Office's webpage, uh, which can provide you with specific information. Um, John, this one may be for you. Dan would like to ask you to review in a little more detail the items included in the basis calculation for the project's property. So if you could speak a little bit more about the basis calculation, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing this in, in Maine for a while, and there's generally um, a, a pretty good sense among the, the developers who are familiar with it about what they can and cannot put in there. The, the sort of big sift is uh, none of the purchase price, uh, none of the reserve dollars in a project. If your lender or your investor is requiring reserves, you cannot include reserves. You can't include prepaid points on financing. And generally anything that is um, uh, not in, within the envelope of the building. So if your project is also requiring uh, water and sewer, and sewer improvements or storm drain improvements that are outside of the property, um, generally those are not eligible. Um, you can get away with certain things that are connected to and absolutely essential to the operation of the building if they're nearby, but that's uh, really kind of a, an uh, uh, interpretation from your local State Historic Preservation Office. Um, but generally, um, uh, anything else that's going into the, into the construction of the building, um, furniture and movable fixtures are not eligible, but certainly um, all of the hard construction costs, and more importantly, all of your soft costs related. So are you architect and engineering, as well as a developer fee are eligible for uh, basis in the, in the uh, historic credit. Well, thank you, Leslie, John. You may have more experience with that uh, as a developer directly. No, you covered it very well. Um, so this is a question for all of you, um, because I do believe um, that Massachusetts has a cap and, I, and Delaware has a cap. I'm not um, sure, John, if you want to comment on this, but in terms of the caps that each state has, um, how do you work around that? Because there's only a set amount of money that the state will give for historic tax credits. So interested in your perspective, maybe first, Leslie, about how you as a developer uh, plan for that in your projects? Well, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily challenging here in Massachusetts. There's typically $55 million um, in tax credit allocation available every year. 
there's three rounds and those rounds aren't necessarily coordinated with the allocation of other affordable housing resources. So I, I must say it's a bit of a, challenge, a challenging dance. And in some cases, historic credits might come in um, once you've already started the, pro the project, which makes folks like John and CDFIs that will provide bridge financing like really, really critical. Um, but if you have the kind of project where you can time multiple rounds and applications for funding, that's the most effective way to maximize the allocation of credits in Massachusetts. It does not work for every project because some kinds of projects have to have 100% of the resources committed at critical um, points. But in some cases, um, we can project our eligibility and our track record in the past and take some limited risk in um, bridging um, resources that might be allocated in future rounds. That's really, really interesting. I don't know, Logan, if you have any comments on that. Yeah, I mean, it's very state specific because some states have a set amount of money that they give out. Some states have, um, you know, you just get a flat percentage of what you're spending. So um, it really depends. And it, it is to your benefit to know how your state is set up. Um, in Pennsylvania, for example, they have a set amount of money and the way that they distribute it is totally at their inclination. Um, so we tell our clients to sort of think of it as a bonus if you happen to get it. Um, other states that have a set percentage, um, you know, if you apply sort of as Renee was saying in the beginning, of, sorry, as Leslie was saying in the beginning of the round or in the beginning of the funding before they run out of money, that's one way to do it. Um, some states like Ohio, you can apply again and again if you don't get money. So um, you just really need a good understanding of how your state program works because they're all kind of all over the place and the nuances um, can get very complicated and have very significant financial implications. Thank you, Logan. That's very well said. Um, so, John, you talked about having to get, and I think Leslie touched on this too, getting everybody on the same curve. So I think that's what Leslie was talking about in terms of the time when financing has to be all aligned, whether it's the low-income housing tax credit and the historic tax credit. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of, of marrying those two up at the right time to make the project work? Uh, yeah, I can talk a little bit about that, the, um, but it does vary from, from state to state. Um, if you are focusing to use the historic tax credit in conjunction with um, one of the other affordable housing credits, whether it's a, a state or uh, the federal LIHTC or low income housing tax credit from the treasury, those are generally um, allocated out. In fact, almost all of them are allocated out on a very competitive usually five to 10 to one over subscription, meaning the state has a dollar of credit and 10 people are showing up for it. Um, so um, those competitive rounds often require a whole bunch of um, spending and preparation on an application process. Um, usually there's a lot of uh, local permitting work that's required in terms of establishing readiness. And so all of those things take time. Um, in the meantime, you're, uh, maybe you don't own the building yet and you're telling your seller, hey, just give me another three months. Here's 10 grand, hard money, non-refundable. Just let me have another three months until I get my award from this credit over here. Um, and then you're, um, you, know, you might lose some of your trades in, in, in a rural state like Maine. Um, uh, labor capacity is, is constricted. We have a, a dramatic shortage of trade labor. So if you don't uh, sign your contract with your builder and execute, uh, you might lose your mechanical contractor who's gonna go on to the next deal and you gotta wait five months before you can get somebody back in. So there's a lot of uh, orchestration. The flutes have to play on the same page as the clarinets on the same page as the brass and, and they're not all on the same calendar. Um, so it, it, it uh, takes a skillful developer to be able to hold uh, all of those players together. Um, I will say, you know, the historic credit uh, in Maine um, is a, uh, it's not a competitive process. And I hate to say this out loud with 120 people listening, but it's not capped either. So uh, <laughs> in one year, uh, we might have $5 million allocated. 
um, and the next year it might be uh, you know forty five million dollars allocated. Um, so uh, with that, I'll say that the success of the program in Maine is now uh, proven um, uh, econometrically. It is returning more money to the state of Maine than it's costing. So that's why we're getting a large endorsement from our legislature uh, for it to continue. But the historic credit um, is, is effective, very effective when paired with some of these others, but um, it's really important to pick your developer agent um, carefully and make sure that they have some experience with this. Um, you know, you can, you can learn it on the fly and usually it takes a couple of declined application rounds for you to learn the, the real tricks about how to put these together. Uh, and as a, an advocate in the community or a building owner or a municipal official um, or just a community developer person, um, you, want that, you want that learning curve to happen on somebody else's clock, somebody else's wallet. <laughs> Um, okay. So you want to be able to get the team that's done this before, so they're not learning as much on, on your watch. Uh, those are really good points. Um, so Nathan wants to know, are most affordable housing projects done with historic tax credits and low income housing tax credits 100% affordable or mixed income? Is either model, model preferable from a financing standpoint? Leslie? Hi. Um, I'll Almost 100% of our projects are um, eligible for low-income housing tax credit, um, simply to maximize the basis and the value of uh, um, affordable housing resources. Um, so um, we have tended to utilize this resource when 100% um, or nearly all units are affordable. Again, if you're gonna go through the hoops <laughs> of um, structuring and timing a project um, to secure all of and coordinate all of these um, tax credits, um, we tend to want to maximize the affordability. Um, we have here in Massachusetts where um, some of the tax credits also have a preference for affordable housing. And hmm. so for that reason, we're incentivized to maximize affordability, which is a great thing here in Massachusetts. Thanks, so uh, yeah, the answer is almost 100% affordable for our projects that, that combine various tax credits. Um, there are a couple of questions here that are specifically about smaller projects. Um, one person is from Eastern Oregon and has approached uh, CDFIs, um, but their one to $3 million projects are too small for the ones um, and they were asking, is there any thoughts on finding CDFIs with interest in small projects? Well, I'll just say that they um, need to be talking to some different CDFIs. A $3 million project is kind of right over the plate for my CDFI, um, in turn, to use the baseball analogy. So, um, and, and I work in, in rural parts of Maine. I saw a question earlier on the chat about you know, can it work in a town with less than a certain number of people? And, and we, we've done historic projects in uh, very rural towns. Um, those generally only work when there is a, uh, a, a benevolent sponsor who's willing to take some risk and probably put more of their own equity than you might find in a conventional deal. Uh, but they do work and um, <clears throat> they can be transformative. There's a, a small town in central Maine called Livermore Falls that has a, a paper mill that used to employ 1,500 people. Um, I think there might be 200 left working there and there was last spring uh, a giant explosion and there's zero people working there now. Um, and that town is at risk of literally falling off the map. Um, but <clears throat> there's still uh, an opportunity there and that I worked with a developer who put together a mixed use project that had a health clinic, uh, a tax prep agency, um, uh, a small engineering firm and, and five units of housing. And those are the exact kind of mixes that you'd find in, in rural communities uh, in Maine that are eligible. We have lots of old buildings, um, so there's lots of stock to take a look at. Uh, and so they, it, it can work in smaller projects. Um, I, I think the, the challenge is um, finding a CDFI who is experienced in understanding how to leverage in those credits. And once 
the CDFI recognizes an opportunity, then the, the leverage goes the other way. They can pull that building owner or that developer to do a little bit further along in terms of the mission and add a little bit more affordable housing or possibly add space for a child care if that's in need in your community. So um, I just encourage those folks in rural areas, keep talking to CDFIs. The ones in your neighborhood are good to start with, but there are other national CDFIs that will work across state lines and, and do small projects. Um, another person wants to know, um, Scott Wolf, uh, that the in, would the anticipated decline in demand for office space significantly expand opportunities for adaptive reuse of those historic commercial buildings for affordable housing? And if so, are there tweaks that you would think about uh, for state historic tax credits that could facilitate those conversions? Any thoughts on that? I mean, my only, yeah, my only thought is that in Boston, um, the land values for commercial versus residential aren't very different. So the economics don't necessarily change radically for us when it comes to the acquisition of a non-residential building. Again, land values are pretty consistent across the board. So at this point, you know, we've been watching the market to see if changes in commercial demand might provide new opportunities for housing and affordable housing development, but we haven't actually seen that come to fruition in a way that we could define the tools that would help us do that effectively. So stay tuned, at least from our perspective in kind of a coastal strong market kind of a community. From a sort of technical tax credit application, there isn't, on a, I mean, there is a difference, but there isn't a substantive difference between putting in office space and putting in residential units. So um, from the way the program is applied, it, it wouldn't make too much of a difference um, from that perspective. I'd just add that um, historically in Maine, I think um, lenders to those projects were probably more comfortable with longer term commercial office users, generally because they were higher credit quality and they would sign five and 10 year leases than uh, residential properties. I think that has now turned um, as those lenders are recognizing those commercial tenants might not be around. Um, but I can tell you firsthand that I know in, in our one big city, Portland, uh, which is a great place to live, um, that the dynamic has changed and uh, commercial space is now worth less than, it, than, than uh, converting that to uh, apartments. And the, um, the trick is that it's a even though the project is required to remain a rental property for five years, there's a sense that there are certain neighborhoods now that are going to accelerate to even further unaffordability and gentrification after the five-year compliance, those housing units are going to flip to condos and that developer is going to go from being able to rent for, you know, I don't know, 1500 bucks a month to suddenly being able to sell those individual units now for 250, 350 or, or even higher. Uh, $500,000 in a marketplace where, uh, you know, the, that kind of um, downtown location with a view and, uh, you know, is, is very rare. So that just, there's a, there's a sense that, you know, we want to see those kind of things happen, but it, it almost is like we're lighting too much of a, uh, of a rocket here with, um, with conversion of historic buildings into residential um, without any, without any governance on making sure that those stay affordable long-term. And at this point, there's no requirement for affordability. Um, you know, the developers can be incentivized to get a little bit richer tax credit if they put affordable units in there, or if they choose to pair it with one of the federal uh, housing. But if, if there's enough market demand and they can do the project on conventional debt and uh, conventional small equity and, and historic credits, that's the way they're gonna go. And then in five years, they can sell out the whole property and, and the return is, uh, pretty healthy for them and, and not so great for the neighborhood. So one of the questions is how many states give priority to the reuse of existing buildings in choosing the recipients of low-income housing tax credits for their state? 
Um, and I have not done a look, and, and it's my understanding that that's set by each state to a qualified allocation plan, right. whether or not the reuse of a building is prioritized. So I don't know in your all states if you all could speak to those specifically. I mean, in Massachusetts, our QAP speaks to production versus preservation. I don't know that they're talking about buildings, <laughs> uh, you know, so much as affordability, but there is a set aside for quote unquote preservation. And that is the bucket where the reuse of historic buildings might fall. So there is a poor, you know, in our QAP, you know, some money set aside specifically in a bucket that would work for historic, you know, reuse or, or rehabilitation. Right, and I would add in Maine, um, it's, it's kind of a passive or an indirect um, uh, incentive in that, you know, the QAP often rewards or, or definitely rewards developers who can leverage in additional resources besides those that are issued by the state housing finance agency. And since the historic tax credit equity is often coming from a third party, that's a way for a project to get extra points by leveraging in those dollars. So there's a way for the QAP to um, indirectly, or I, I almost call it passively encourage developers to go find uh, those projects where they can bring in that additional equity. Um, but then, you know, there's a lot of other requirements of the construction standards that these historic buildings might not be able to make. So you have to be able to weigh those things out when you're taking a look at your site. Um, I, I wish there were more, um, more teeth in the, in the gravity in the QAP to encourage not only historic use, but just flat old you know, infill housing, keep these projects in communities and don't put them four miles out because that's where the cheap land is. Um, so uh, we're working on that, but um, haven't solved all of those problems yet. I think it's good. Logan? Yeah, I would certainly just say um, it is not the norm for the, the preservation of buildings to get you any kind of significant bump. Um, and as John said, it sometimes com can complicate things. Um, so obviously, that is definitely an area in which improvement could be made, I think, across the board. So I apologize at this point that we're not going to be able to answer everybody's questions, but we have uh, copied the questions down and we'll try and find other ways to answer either through a forum blog or individually get back to each of you. So we really appreciate all of the excellent questions that we received and we appreciate all the excellent answers that we got from our presenters. So thank you very much for that. Um, so with that, we would like to just encourage you all to participate in other um, forum webinars. So maybe if we could see the next slide. Um, Forum Connect is a way to uh, continue this discussion through our online community uh, for people who are in the business like us of saving places. Um, we have active conversations going on all week, um, whether it's historic sites or section 106. So if you haven't joined Forum Connect, it's a great, ways, great place to keep up these types of discussions. We also have an upcoming uh, webinar on August 14th about interpretation strategies where women made history. So that is a great opportunity uh, in August uh, for folks to continue learning. And then we would like to thank everyone who joined uh, this webinar today. It's been a great discussion. We are so thankful for the panelists who joined us uh, to share with us their knowledge. So thank them. We'd like to thank you and we will definitely uh, keep up the conversation because this is a very important topic. Thank you.